Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to The Extra Mile. My name is Gene Gurkhoff, and in this episode, we'll be walking in Topsfield, Massachusetts with Dan Pallotta, who is not only a pioneer when it comes to walking, running, and biking for charity. He's raised over half a billion dollars with the walks, runs, and rides that he's created for charity. He's also an author, an entrepreneur, and a thought leader, and he will change the way that you think about charity. He's certainly changed the way that I think about charity, and it's a really insightful interview. You're going to love it. Real quick before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to our partners at prizio.com. Prizio offers really awesome sweepstakes for charity. Like right now, they've got a sweepstakes where you can win tickets to join Lynn manuel Miranda at the opening of Hamilton in Los Angeles. And the sweepstakes benefits a number of very worthy immigration charities. So go check them out at prizio.com. That's P-R-I-Z-E-O dot com. We are super grateful for the opportunity to be partnering with them. And of course, we're grateful to all of you for joining us. Thanks so much for walking with us. Let's turn up the volume and turn on your charity miles and come along for the walk with me and Dan Pallotta in Topsfield, Massachusetts. Every mile matters. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Extra Mile. It is a sunny, warm day in Topsfield, Massachusetts, and I am walking along a rail trail with a very special guest, Dan Pallotta. Did I say that right? Pallotta or Pallotta? You said it right the first time. Pallotta, uh, who is just incredibly important in our world because he is a pioneer in the walk, run, and bike space for charity. Uh, he created the first AIDS ride, if I'm getting that right, uh, and some of the first three-day cancer walks, and he's an author of a few books about uh, charitable issues, which we'll get into. He's got a very famous TED Talk, which I believe is one of the most watched TED Talks, which we'll get into, and he is the founder of the Charity Defense Council and Advertising for Humanity He's got a lot of really great projects going on, which I hope we'll have some time to dive into. But first, Dan, thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Nice to be walking with you. So just to quick give our, our listeners a picture of where we're walking and a little bit of background on Topsfield, uh, where are we right now? <laughs> ah, we're in Topsfield, Massachusetts. It's about oh, 20, 25 miles north of Boston. It borders Ipswich and... Uh, Wenham and Georgetown, Boxford, and it's it's home to the uh, oldest operating fair in America, the Topsfield Fair, which I think started really? in the early 1800s. Yeah, it still still operating continues fair. every o- October. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and it's very country. I think I've read that the population is like 6,000, so not exactly suburbia, but it's very country-like. We're on a beautiful rail trail. And I hope that all of you are out there walking or running along with us. Uh, so, Dan, can you give us a little bit of background on you and your story and how you got started along your journey? Uh, yeah, well, I I created the AIDS Rides and the Breast Cancer Three Days, and we raised uh, close to $600 million over the course of nine years by um, responding, I think, to... Uh, an inner hero in people that had not been fully unleashed and that was dying for expression in the name of causes that people cared about deeply. And I I started doing that work in the 1990s and the idea for the first AIDS ride came out of uh, a project I did in college when I was a, a senior at Harvard. I organized 38 of my classmates to bicycle across America with me wow. to raise money for Oxfam, which is what an international is hunger relief and development agency. That was 1983, the summer of wow. 1983. So we rode 4,200 miles from uh, wow. Seattle <laughs> to Boston with a U-Haul truck and a Ford van and no water stops and no pit stops. And, <laughs> and you know, we stayed in church function halls and we didn't have spandex. We had, you know, cotton <laughs> high school, college gym pants and and what kind of these bikes were they like? They weren't like the carbon fiber that you people No, ride. it was a heavy bike. I still have it. It was it was a company called Kabuki that gave us a deal <laughs> on uh, 
on you know 38 bikes uh i don't know they were probably probably just 10 speed or maybe they were 15 speed bikes and uh you know little no toe clips just a little leather cages for your your shoes and it was a very powerful experience you know to see the the generosity of america to um see what you go through emotionally and physically and spiritually on a journey like that and so you know i'm gay when i started to lose a lot of friends to aids I, I, I could see that there was nothing like that for people in the AIDS community to do. There was nothing heroic. There were only little gestures. You know, you could go for the AIDS walk on a Saturday morning for five kilometers, or you could stick a red ribbon on your jacket, or you could go to the AIDS dance-a-thon on a Saturday night. And I felt that there, there were a lot of people out there um, yearning for something more to do in the name of the friends that they'd lost to AIDS or uh, in the name of their own lives, you know, in the case of people who were HIV positive. So the AIDS rides came out of that and the breast cancer three days came out of the AIDS rides and the out of the darkness suicide prevention walks came hmm. out of all that. So. so just to dial back a little bit to that first ride across the country, had you been a cyclist before that? No. No, know, just... just- just a normal kid with his bike. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, so what gave you the idea to, to do that in the first place? <clears throat> I had been involved in the Hunger Project, which was calling for the end of hunger by the year 2000. It was a, it was a very, it was an enormous, audacious vision. And uh, when I, I, I was chairing the Hunger Action Committee at Harvard as a freshman, and we were just doing little things. We were doing little fundraisers for Oxfam and I was frustrated by how little they were and I wanted to do something big. Didn't have any big ideas. Was riding my bike to the beach one day, had a little transistor radio on the handlebars, heard about these two guys who were biking across America for cancer research and I thought, ah, that's what I want to do, something really big like that. (laughs) So so I didn't want to do it, it was just two people. We did it, 40 of us did it. We spent the year organizing it, we spent the year looking for people, you know. And, and so then that turned into eventually the AIDS ride and the three-day... The AIDS rides. We AIDS did, rides. Yeah, we did uh, many of them. We, there was not just one. We did. We started it in California. That was a seven-day bike ride from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Then we expanded it and did one from every year, from Boston to New York, from uh, Orlando to Miami, from... Uh, the Twin Cities to Chicago, from North Carolina to Washington, D.C. Then we launched a series of events called the AIDS Vaccine Rides, and one of those we did across Alaska, from Fairbanks to Anchorage. Uh, One of them was across the Continental Divide in Montana, called the Montana AIDS Vaccine Ride. So, Which uh, was your favorite, or the most beautiful, or can you... uh, The most beautiful... Uh... You know, probably either Alaska or Montana, one of those. Although the California coast is also pretty incredible. Yeah. You know, one of those. So, so we did the AIDS rides. We started them in 94. Did the first one, expanded them to five cities by 1996. Then in 1998, launched the Breast Cancer 3-Day in L.A. That was very successful. It netted $4 million. The first time we did it, there's some chickens. Oh, wow, there's some chickens here. <laughs> Holy cow, there's like wild chickens just hanging out on the side of this rail trail. <laughs> um, we did, uh, in, in 1998, we, we did the first breast cancer three day. It was very successful. So we expanded to four cities the next year, seven the year after that, nine the year after that, and 13 the year after that. So we were raising about... Uh, we were raising about $180 million, about $160 million a year by 2002. Wow. Yeah, all based on the simple idea that there are a lot of people out there who want to do something really extraordinary. And, you know, I should say it was, it was never about athleticism. It was never about right. biking. It was never about walking. It was about... Metaphor, a metaphorical journey. Yeah. A, you know, a journey of your heart and a journey of your soul. So, you know, people people like to commodify things and reduce things down. So in the years since we've done those events, people talk about the, the walk-run industry, you know. Yep. Um, 
Well, I suppose that's an industry, and if that's the industry you're interested in, that's great. It was never what I was interested in. I'm mm-hmm. interested in the soul industry. The soul industry. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Um, you know, it's really interesting that you bring that up, and it's something that I was really thinking about how to ask you, and because um, it's something that I think about a lot. You know, it's somewhat of a unique phenomenon to things like walking, running, and biking that they go together with charity and trying to make a difference not totally it's not you know exclusive but i've never i love snowboarding and i love skiing i've never said hey i'm going snowboarding this weekend will you sponsor me for this for the michael j fox foundation right but people all the time when they, they sign they when they want to make a difference for a cause they'll sign up for a long walk or or a short walk or a run or a 5k or a marathon where they'll ride the bike across the country it, it tends to be those types of things and of course there's other things as well people play golf they have parties but it's a really unique phenomenon to walking running and biking and I was wondering if you had any inclination as to what that was about well there's a great tradition of of journeys on behalf of important causes whether it's you know the march on Washington Martin Luther King's march on Washington yep. the march from uh, Montgomery to Selma, yep. or Selma to Montgomery, I forget. Yep. Uh, and then, you know, back in the back in the 70s, there were charity walks, and they were they were difficult, actually. I remember doing one, I think it was called the the, the Boston Hunger Walk, uh, and it was long. It was, it was 15 or 18 miles or something. As a kid, you know, you yeah, were exhausted at the end of it. So the idea there was look, I'm going to do something that's uncomfortable and that's difficult for me. Uh, and uh, if I do that, will you do this? And the, you know, if I do that, will you give me some money for it? And it's almost like a dare. Uh, right. And the AIDS ride, the AIDS rides in the breast cancer three days were kind of the, almost the ultimate example of that, the, our cross country bike ride. I will ride my bike across America if you will do this I will ride my bike seven seven days down the coast of California and you know 80 90 mm-hmm. miles a day and sleep in a tent every night if you will pledge me two hundred dollars mm-hmm. and I, I think the reason those events were so successful financially is people's willingness to contribute is correlated to the audacity of what it is you're gonna do if I told you right now that uh, I was gonna climb Mount Everest without oxygen to yep. raise money for you know trachoma mm-hmm. to, to prevent blindness in children in Africa you would be inspired to give me a lot more money than if I said hey I'm going to do a 5k this Saturday mm-hmm. morning for kids with leukemia you right. know that's interesting too or for kids with, with trachoma for that matter right. you know just to keep yeah things equal so so you started those uh, three-day cancer walks, very successful. Your company helped raise almost $600 million for really worthy causes, which is phenomenal. And then, if you don't mind telling us what happened. We went out of business very suddenly in 2002 when our, our partner on the breast cancer three days, which had become most of our business, they were like 75% of our business, um, decided that they were kind of tired of the news stories about our overhead expenses being high. And our overhead expenses, you can imagine, you know, we're taking care of 6,000 people mm-hmm. over the course of three days. We've got to feed them, we've got to shower them, we've got to provide chemical toilets, medical care, and we've got to spend a lot of money on advertising to find those 6,000 people, to yep. recruit those 6,000 people to walk. So, you know, we had historically like a 40 45% overhead on the events but what people look at is that figure they say oh i'd rather give to the big sale that only has one percent overhead you have 45 percent overhead yeah but we just raised 160 million dollars and the big sale raised 10 right so the big sale sent nine dollars to your favorite cause and we sent 70 million so don't look at the percentage right. nonetheless people did so our sponsor said we're gonna go try the events on our own and um what happened was their their overhead went up and their net income went down from uh, 71 million dollars with us in 2002 it dropped 60 million dollars in one year to about 11 million dollars and that's as I said in my TED talk this is what happens when we confuse frugality with morality 
Right. Yeah. And so maybe that's a good segue into you wrote a book called Uncharitable. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And you also gave a TED Talk, which I think is kind of like a summary of the book. Exactly. Um, which I'll also put a link to in the, in the show notes. And at, at one point, it was, still might be, it was one of the most watched TED Talks of all time. Yeah, it was, um, well, it's up there, you know, it's been four years and yeah. the internet keeps exploding <laughs> and TED keeps exploding, so the talks keep coming out. But it's, I, I think it's the 15th most commented TED Talk wow. of all time. There's a lot of it's TED Talks. one of the top 50 most persuasive TED Talks of all time. Wow. So it's, it's up there in a number of categories. And yeah, the book was a chronicle of all of the dysfunction all of the dysfunctional thinking that I saw in our culture when it comes to charity while I was building that successful enterprise I could see that we were being criticized for doing things to um, dramatically increase the revenue on our events that no one would pay the least bit of attention to in the for-profit sector right. if it was Apple trying to dramatically increase the sales of the iPhone, whether it was advertising, you're spending money on flashy advertising. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, guess how many millions uh, times more L'Oreal is spending on flashy advertising to try and get you to buy cosmetics. We're just trying to compete with them and Budweiser and McDonald's to get people to care about people with AIDS and breast cancer or salaries you know we want everybody paid cheaply in charity and we don't think well, wh well what kind of talent do you think that's going to draw you don't say to the to the Boston Red Sox go out and find the cheapest pitcher you can find you say we want to win the World Series go find the best pitcher you can possibly find we don't care what you have to pay them up our ticket prices we'll pay it we just want to win the World Series right don't we feel that way about cancer and AIDS and yeah, suicide, don't exactly. we want, you know, the most winning people? Mm -hmm. So anyway, Uncharitable is about, <clears throat> Uncharitable is like a, it's, it's an attempt to enlighten people. People are well-meaning, you know, they want their donation to make a difference. And they've been taught that low overhead means it's making a difference. Low overhead doesn't mean it's making a difference. Low overhead just means the organization either isn't spending much on overhead or um, is practicing accounting that makes it look like they're spending very little on overhead but it doesn't tell you anything about what good the organization is doing right. you know what, what good is it if an organization says we only spend five percent on overhead at our soup kitchen but the soup is rancid and the staff is unfriendly those are the things you want to know about right how many people does it feed how many people does it feed how well does it feed them how well do those people do over time who cares about the overhead if you're solving the problem? Yeah, it'd be like saying, I don't want to invest in Google because they <coughs> spend a ton of money on their back office and all sorts of things that have nothing to do with their advertising product. But, yeah, well, you know, it's like, then you know, it's just a simple example. It's like, it's, like, um, it's like using a person's weight to measure their character. <laughs> right. That's good. And so I guess and you've kind of touched on it. Uh, a lot of the key points from your TED Talk, but if, and the TED Talk is a kind of Cliff Notes version of the book. If you could give us like a Cliff Cliff Notes version of like the five points that you talk about in the TED Talk, and of the ways that kind of these double standards are holding our charities back. Yeah, we we we, we want to change the world, right? We want to we want to end diseases. We want to we want to end homelessness. We want to reduce poverty. We want to tackle all these gigantic, gigantic problems. Well, if we want to tackle gigantic problems, we need charities that are kind of gigantic in scale in order to address them. But we have a rule book for charities that keeps them miniature. Um, we have two rule books. We have one for the nonprofit sector, one for the for-profit sector. And we tell nonprofits, you can't pay people very much money to have them come and work for you. Meanwhile, we tell the for-profit sector, go pay people whatever you want and we'll celebrate all your beautiful homes on the pages of Architectural Digest. We tell the nonprofit sector, you can't advertise on anywhere near the scale the for-profit sector does. So the for-profit sector monopolizes the public's attention. We tell the nonprofit sector, you can't take any chances with our donated money on figuring out new ways to raise money. 
but Disney and uh, you know Miramax and all the others can spend 200 million dollars testing out a movie to see if they can make a lot of money with it without having any idea about whether or not it's going to succeed. We tell nonprofits you got to make everything happen within the 12 month time frame of the uh, tax form 990, but we tell the for profit sector like Amazon or Twitter, you take 20 years to make money if you need to. You take as long as you like. And then we give the for profit sector a stock market to have all this play money to test out their new ideas. And you can't have a stock market with the nonprofit sector. You can't pay profits in the nonprofit sector. So you put those five discriminations together and you have just hopelessly hogtied the nonprofit sector and undermined it from its potential. And then we wonder, well, why isn't it solving the world's greatest problems? So, um, you turn around. You want to turn around? Yep. Great. Oh, come on, let's stop you. So, I think that's a great summary. And again, I'll put a, a link to the TED Talk and the book in the show notes. And given how influential and how uh, often watched and commented this TED Talk has been, um... How successful do you think it has been in in moving that dialogue forward or changing changing those double standards? We've we've had a lot of progress in changing the way people think. You know, it, it hasn't been me. There have been a lot of others, like the the people at GuideStar doing hard work, or you know, Art Taylor at the Better Business Bureau, Wise Giving Alliance, trying to change the way their customers look at things. But about uh, <clears throat> three months after I gave that TED Talk, three of the the big evaluating agencies, uh, GuideStar, Charity Navigator, and the Better Business Bureau got together and issued a joint press release saying to the general public, um, don't ask if a charity has low overhead, ask if it has big impact, uh, high performance. We don't need low overhead, we need high performance. So that was huge for uh, especially like Charity Navigator to sign on to a statement like that. Last year, Darren Walker, the head of the Ford Foundation, issued a very brave press release in which he said this this overhead measure is a charade uh, that we've been willing participants in, and, and it doesn't measure the value of the, um, the charity's programs, and we've been underfunding their real expenses, and we've known it. Uh, and there's a conversation now about impact. They didn't exist 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. The conversation was all about overhead. So um, so I, th I think we're making progress, and it's going to take a lot more effort to make progress in the general public. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a conversation the general public doesn't really know is happening. Yeah. Um, so it's very similar to moving public opinion on gay marriage or seatbelts or smoking, and and we've we've barely just begun you know we created something called the charity defense council right. specifically to to change the way the public thinks about these things because the nonprofit sector doesn't have any organization that's trying to change public attitudes about these things so we here in massachusetts last year ran eight big high profile digital billboards that clear channel donated that said to people don't ask if a charity has low overhead ask if it has high impact and it's the first time that you know that message has been uttered to anyone other than ourselves hmm. um, we had a meeting last week with the Massachusetts Attorney General to look at how can we create a regulatory ecosystem that will change the way the public thinks about these things and and the people in the in the AG's office were great they were awesome they we're really open to figuring out, you know, how could we work together to maybe model something that could be used in other states? Because when an attorney general's office says you should watch out for high overhead and you yeah, should look at, uh, you know, Charity Watch and what their grade is on overhead, that has a big influence on the public. So if the AG's office start to say other things, that will shift public thinking too. Um, you know, I, I can feel that even in the work that we do because we work with a pretty broad range of charities, but a lot of very kind of big ones. And oftentimes we'll get emails from people saying, how come you only support the big charities? Um, or this organization spends too much on overhead. And I always just reply by sending them your TED Talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I would say that in the, in the past five years of doing this, that those emails have um, become less frequent. So hopefully that's a barometer of public perception changing. Are there any organizations that have emerged 
or maybe even with the, the rating agencies that you, you mentioned um, that are starting to do a better job of actually evaluating impact? And how might an agency or a third party actually do that? Because it's such a <coughs> nebulous thing for so many of these causes. Yeah, GuideStar is doing a really great job, and they're doing it by allowing the nonprofit organizations to report very sophisticated data themselves and turn that into very simple charts and graphs for the general public. So I would say GuideStar is leading the charge on that. So how would uh, something like uh, suicide prevention, how would an organization like that report its impact in, in, in a way that is showing that it's having impact? Well, the first thing you'd want to do is... is you, you, you want to show intention to have an impact more than you actually want to sh- show impact, right? There might be some problems that are very, very difficult to show impact on right now. If you mm-hmm. ask Jonas Salk six, six months before he finds a polio vaccine, what impact are you having on polio? <laughs> he right. would have to yeah. say none, you know? Right. Um, so you want to be very careful about that because you don't want to create another simplistic measure. If you start focusing just on short-term impact, you're going to have charities racing to the problems that are easy to show short-term impact right. on. Like, we served 10,000 bowls of soup this month. Yeah, but what did you do about trying to end homelessness? Right, because right. that's a much more difficult problem to solve. Suicide is like that. So right. you really want to find out what are the organization's goals? What progress are they making toward those goals? How do they know? What are the things they think are important to measure? And if, if the suicide charity can't tell you what things they think are important to measure, then you got a problem. Right. It just might be a little bit difficult to do it in a uniform way where you could... Because, you know, for one organization, serving those bowls of soup might be its mission. You know, they see an immediate need that they want to right. address. And the other organization might say, well, it's great that that organization is focused on the immediate need. We want to focus on the more systemic, long-term issue. And then it might just become a little challenging for the the, the people out here in the, in the universe to, to evaluate what impact means for each of them. But I think that's probably okay, and that's probably how it should be. We need to, you know, be willing to put up with a little bit more kind of uh, thoughtfulness on our end as to the organizations we, we want to support. Um, so with the Charity Defense Council, what's an example of some of the, the other work that you're doing in uh, and how that's helping to move the needle forward. Well, the other thing, separate from the Charity Defense oh. Council, that I'm doing right now is I, I get in tons of requests after every speech that I give to a nonprofit organization. How do I get my board to think this way? You know, I wish my board had been here. So last year we created something called the Boulder Board Training. And we did the first one in Boston. It sold out. We had a, a huge success. And it's designed to help. CEOs and EDs get their board members to start dreaming with them, to start dreaming on big, sophisticated aspirations for impact. So that first one was so successful, we're doing uh, six of them this year. We're doing Boston again, we're doing New York, Washington, D.C., Saratoga, um, Austin, Texas, and Wisconsin. And people can go to boulderboard.com and find out all about it, but it's... uh, it's one thing for an executive director or a development director to believe these things and want to change things, but the power rests with the board. So the key is getting the board to get excited about a dream and to say, to hell with overhead, let's solve this social problem. And uh, the Boulder Board Training really light, lights people up and awakens them to something that they, a distinction that they didn't really draw. They didn't really know that there was something other than keeping the budget <coughs> in good shape and keeping overhead low. It didn't dawn on them that they could dream. Hmm. It doesn't dawn on Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg not to dream. Right. It doesn't <laughs> dawn on Jeff Bezos and Tim Cook and Johnny Ive not to dream. But it doesn't occur to the nonprofit sector to dream. You know, the for-profit sector dreams of all these impossible things and the nonprofit sector finds it impossible to dream. Why? Because they're trying to be um, good obeyers of all of these rules they've been given under the mistaken assumption that if you obey, obey all the salary and overhead rules, you're somehow helping people. Well, that's just bullshit. You're not. Mm-hmm. You're killing people. Hmm. It's interesting that a lot of the people on boards, though, are 
those dreamers in another sphere. They are. I and, mean, you know, and it goes back to the classic uh, ameliorative purpose of charity back in the 1600s where the Puritans came here to make all this money. And, but making money would get you sent to hell. So they, they needed something to balance that out. And charity became the place where they balanced that out. So to this day, business people go make a lot of money in the for-profit sector. And then when they come into the for-profit sector, they, they sort of put on their silly hats and say, okay, they don't realize they're saying this, but they're saying, okay, all the things I did to make my business successful, we're going to do none of that here, okay? <laughs> we're not going to spend any money on talent. We're not going to spend any money on marketing. We're not going to take any chances. We're not going to think in the long term, and we're not going to use capital. There. Let's go change the world. Huh. So do you find that in these Boulder Board... Well, you've done one. We've done our first one, you know, yeah. How many gets, people were a part of it? Uh, 165 people did the first one. From how many different organizations? Uh, probably about 30 different organizations. And how did they come to it? You know, we advertised, you advertised it. it yeah. yeah, we took out a, a you know a half page ad in the Boston Globe on Sunday in full color on page two, and um, you know we we mailed to local mailing lists, and um, we, you know we did ad tracking on so in Facebook a way, and all that. In a way, these people are you know early adopters of this message. They probably have some propensity to already believe it, and maybe they're already somewhere along the spectrum of being those boulder boards but were there some people in there that you could feel were really you know really needed to be educated on this well i would say you know the whole the whole purpose of the bold boulder board training was to preach to someone other than the choir okay. so i would not at all say that everybody okay. came in the room with a propensity all into already believe all of these things I, I would say a lot of executive directors and ceos who are big fans of these ideas, got their board members who've never heard these ideas to come to the training. Got it. So they, you know, they walked in uninitiated and they left convinced, yes, the way, the way we think about charity is stupid. Huh. And do you find, let's see, how do I ask this? You're not preaching to the choir are there skeptics? Do you encounter, you know, many skeptics or people who don't agree with what you're saying these oh, days? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I, I mean, not the majority. It's a very narrow minority, but there, there are people, and mostly, God love them. They're people who've just never heard the argument before, and or they're people who have heard someone say what someone else said about what Dan Pallotta thinks. So they don't actually have the idea captured correctly. You know, they have. They have, oh, for example, you know, half of the interviews I do, the, the, the editor at the newspaper or the radio station who comes up with the headlines, because the reporter is never typically the one who comes up with the headlines, will write a headline that says, uh, you know, activist believes charity should act more like business. That's a complete misstatement of what, I, what I'm trying to preach. What I'm saying is, please stop telling charities to act more like business because you are not for a moment ready to give them the big league freedoms you really give to business. So it's abusive to tell them to act more like business as if they're too stupid to act like business. They would act more like business in the ways where it's appropriate if they didn't get crucified every time they tried it. Um, so, you know, there are some critics who are critics of someone other than me. <laughs> right. You know, they've, they've made up some phantom of, of someone who has some ideas that are not mine and they put my name on them. So there's that. And then there are people who, you know, genuinely believe money doesn't make a difference. You can hire the same level of talent for $50,000 as you can for $500,000. And, you know, I just fundamentally disagree with that. I think that that um, it argues with the whole of economic history if that's the case if money does, doesn't make a difference then why do you pay your executive director any more money than you pay your maintenance staff mm -hmm. why obviously because that that incremental difference allows you to hire from a different talent pool that's the thing people have the critics have the biggest argument with and you know my biggest response to that is okay let's say you're right you win i'm wrong money doesn't make a difference you can find the same talent 
for 50 grand as you can for 500 grand. Now, tell that person that you just got to take a $450,000 salary cut. You also don't have any money to hire away your business school and law school friends. Mm -hmm. You don't have any money to advertise. You can't take any risks. You got to make everything happen in 12 months and you don't have any capital. There, go fulfill <laughs> your potential, right? So, Sounds like being a startup. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because in, that's not true. Because in a startup, right. you have this enormous hope. If you're Uber or Airbnb right. or SpaceX, you sacrifice all of that because there's this huge jackpot potentially right. waiting for you down the end of the line. In the nonprofit sector, not only is there no huge jackpot waiting for you personally, there's not even a huge jackpot waiting for you in terms of the very thing you care about, which is ending AIDS or ending cancer or whatever it is, because you can't do any of the things that will allow you to achieve that. Right. So, so changing public attitudes is everything, and we've done that. You know, this is not like a despairing message. We've yeah. changed the way yeah, people think about gay marriage. We've changed the way they think about eating pork with the other white meat. You know, we've changed <laughs> the way they think about milk with Tobacco. God milk. And so, you know, we're the Charity Defense Council is aimed at the general public. The Boulder Board training is aimed at really helping executive directors and CEOs who are frustrated with how little their boards are thinking and, and getting them to think in much bigger ways. You know, if we if we continue to advance on these fronts will change this we will absolutely change it and that'll change the world what do you think maybe even in like a broader perspective you know from your i mean you've been so so much a part of the space from with what you do with actually creating the aids rides and the charity walks to now this book and the ted talk and the the boulder board initiative what do you think is on the horizon where do you see all of this going well, ultimately, you know, my, my unified theory of social change is that we need to dramatically consolidate the sector so that there's not so much redundancy happening and, and uh, repetition of fixed costs. Mm -hmm. We need to dramatically increase... So that means like mergers, like merging Mergers organizations. and acquisitions, yeah. yeah. We need to dramatically increase the amount of... Um, money that is going to those consolidated organizations and we can do that by dramatically increasing public awareness which is you know let charities run Super Bowl ads and primetime television ads as much as Apple and Microsoft do it um, and then we can start to achieve real change if we consolidate the sector increase giving funnel the increase giving to the to the best most innovated innovative consolidated efforts then we'll start to see scale then we'll start to see real change because so much of this is scale so there are so many good ideas out there we don't need more good ideas we have people with really good ideas working on domestic hunger working on clean water working on methane detection working on um, the bail system, working on eliminating blindness. They have great methods. They don't have enough money to take them to scale. Uh, do you see, like, a role for, like, uh, for-profit in this? Yeah, absolutely. You know, look, there's a... The, the line between what has a social impact and what doesn't almost doesn't exist for me. You know, how, I, how can you say Apple is not a social enterprise? Look at right. the difference the iPad is making in education or the iPhone is making in the lives of the blind or the Apple Watch, all the data yep. that's coming in on autism. So, but, but for, you know, traditional for-profits can also work with nonprofits by providing them capital so that they can invest in revenue-generating ideas. That's how we built the AIDS rides and the breast cancer three days. For-profit companies gave us capital, debt, essentially, that we used to launch the events in new cities. And in the absence of that capital, we could never have done it. You know, nonprofits are by and large oblivious to the notion of capital. They think everything's a zero sum game. Well, if I'm going to try some big new fundraising endeavor that's going to cost a million bucks up front, I got to get a steal a million dollars from the program side. No, 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 you don't. You go get capital. Do you think, you think that um, Elon Musk is stealing all the money from Tesla to launch SpaceX? No. He got a separate pool of capital to launch SpaceX. Do you think 
Apple is skimping on the R&D on the iPhone in order to launch their new car. No, they're using their massive pools of capital to launch the whole new car enterprise. So you need to find you know, wealthy individuals, foundations, corporations that are willing to provide capital, experimentation capital for creating new revenue streams. That's great. And as we're kind of wrapping up the walk here, uh, I do appreciate your time. What would be your, your major call to action to all the folks out there who are walking with us? What's one thing they can do to help? Um, well, they can do a couple things. They can, next time they give to charity, don't ask about the overhead, ask about the impact. Actually call the charity up, ask to meet with the development director, find out what impact they're having, ask them to take you on a tour of their facilities. And if you work for a nonprofit organization or you know someone who does, Tell them to go to boulderboard.com and register their board for the Boulder Board Training. That will change things in one day. Uh, we'll put links to that in the show notes too. Dan, <coughs> thank you very much for walking with us. Thanks to all of you for joining us and walking with us. Every mile matters. Thanks, Gene. That, that was fun. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Gene again. Thanks so much for walking with me and Dan Pallotta in Totsfield, Massachusetts today. Hope that you found this interview as insightful as I did. Please subscribe to the podcast, share it with your friends, and leave a review. It really helps get the word out. And be sure to tune in again next week where we'll be running on the Embarcadero in San Francisco with author and thought leader Nir Eyal, who literally wrote the book on habit-forming technologies. And you're going to get a little inside baseball as to what we think about when we go to work each day and try to make the Charity Miles app better for everybody. So thanks again for walking with us today. See you again next week. Every mile matters.